ทิปิโสปะโกวะอะระหะสัมมาสัมปุตโตวิจาจารณสัมปันโนสุขาโทโลกาวิดูอานุตาโรปุริสตัมมาสัก So here we are. So we're going to read from Majjhima Nikaya 22, Alagatu Alagatu Pama Sutta, the simile of the snake. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindaka's Park. Now, on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in a bhikkhu named Arita, formerly of the vulture killers. Thus, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. This is a deeply pernicious view. Because what are obstructions? Obstructions are hindrances, sensual pleasures. So what he's saying is that those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. If you engage in a hindrance. Does it continue to hinder your mind? If you engage in sensual pleasures, if you identify with them, doesn't it cause craving? Doesn't it cause aversion? So his understanding really is that, you know, once you are a monastic, once you know the Dhamma, then even if you have to deal with hindrances. Even if you have to deal with sensual pleasures, in particular, they're not going to affect you if you engage in them. Engage here is the operative word. Engage means to actually interact with them, to interact with them with a sense of self, to interact with them with craving or aversion or whatever it might be. Several bhikkhus, having heard about this, went to the bhikkhu Arita and asked him, "Friend Arita." Is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friends. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Then these bhikkhus, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus. Friend Arita, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus, for in many ways the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions, and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair. And that the danger in them is still more, with the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the piece of meat, with the simile of the grass torch, with the simile of the pit of coals, with the simile of the dream, with the simile of the borrowed goods, with the simile of fruits on a tree, with the simile of the butcher's knife and block, with the simile of the sword stake, with the simile of the snake's head. The Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by those bhikkhus in this way, the bhikkhu Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, still obstinately adhere to that pernicious view and continue to insist upon it. Since the bhikkhus were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him all that had occurred, adding, "Venerable sir, since we could not detach the bhikkhu Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, from this pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One." Then the Blessed One addressed a certain bhikkhu thus. Come, Bhikkhu, tell the Bhikkhu Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and went to the Bhikkhu Arita and told him, the teacher calls you, friend Arita. 
Yes, friend, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Arita, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Exactly so, Venerable Sir, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. So what does the Blessed One say? Misguided man. Not good. <laughs> when, the Buddha, when the Buddha calls you misguided, it comes from the Pali word murk, which means actually stupid. <laughs> <laughs> to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them? I have stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the piece of meat, with the simile of the grass torch, with the simile of the pit of coals, with the simile of the dream, with the simile of the borrowed goods, with the simile of fruits on a tree, with the simile of the butcher's knife and block, with the simile of the sword stake, with the simile of the snake's head, I have stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. But you, get misguided man, by your wrong grasp, have misrepresented us, injured yourself, and stored up much demerit, for this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, what do you think? Has the bhikkhu Arvita, formerly of the vulture killers, Kindle even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma and discipline. How could he, Venerable Sir? No, Venerable Sir. When this was said, the Bhikkhu Arita, formerly of the vulture killer, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and without response. Then knowing this, the Blessed One told him, Misguided man, you will be recognized by your pernicious view. I shall question the bhikkhus on this matter. When the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me as this bhikkhu, Aritha, formerly of the vulture killers, does, when by his wrong grasp he misrepresents us, injures himself, and stores up much demerit? With a question like that, you better say no. <laughs> no, Venerable Sir. For in many ways, the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much despair, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of the skeleton and so on, the Blessed One has stated that the danger in them is still more. Good bhikkhus, it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus. For in many ways I have stated how obstructive things are obstructive and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. I have stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of the skeleton and so on, I have stated that the danger in them is still more. But this bhikkhu Arita, formerly of the vulture killers, by his wrong grasp misrepresents us, injures himself, and stores up much demerit, for this will lead to his, this misguided man's harm and suffering for a long time. Bhikkhus, that one can engage in sensual pleasures without sensual desires, without perceptions of sensual desire, without thoughts of sensual desire, that is impossible. Mm -hmm. So, here 
the Buddha is saying, remember a couple of days ago, we talked about how the Buddha said, it's not the sensual pleasures themselves. That's the problem. It's the lustful intention, mm -hmm. the craving. So the operative word here is engage. That one can engage in sensual pleasures. That one can identify with them. Without sensual desires, without perceptions of sensual desire, without thoughts of sensual desire, that is impossible. Here, bhikkhus, some misguided men learn the Dhamma, discourses, stanzas, expositions, verses, exclamations, sayings, birth stories, marvels, and answers to questions. But having learned the Dhamma, they do not examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Not examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they do not gain a reflective acceptance of them. What does it mean to examine, examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom? It means to apply the teachings. It means to actually do the teachings and see for yourself if this works. And then once you see for yourself, confirm if your experiences match with the suttas. When you first read the suttas without any experience at all, you really do need a code breaker. You really need something because when you start reading it, there's so much there. There's so much dense information over there, right? But there's no way for you to make sense of it. But once you actually have someone who can guide you and someone who's walked the path, someone who can lead you and say, here are the signposts. Here's what to do. Here's the suggestion. Here's the advice. Here's the recommendation. And you follow that and see for yourself and then walk the path. And then you go back to the suttas. You recognize what the suttas are talking about. Oh, this is what they mean by the first jhana. This is what they mean by craving. This is what they mean by dependent origination. This is what they mean by clinging. This is what they mean by contact and feeling and perception and so on. So instead of that, they learn the Dhamma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates. And they do not experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Those teachings being wrongly grasped by them conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. Why is that? Because of the wrong grasp of those teachings. So they learn the Dhamma, that is to say, they learn it at face value. My teacher told me this, and so I'm going to just repeat what my teacher told me. Not really actually do it or look at what they're saying and actually try to apply it. So the suttas say so and so, so I've heard. So I will just take that at face value instead of actually doing it. And then what happens? You become a Dhamma defender. You start to see if other people are criticizing your Dhamma, quote unquote, your Dhamma. And then you start to get offended by it and you start to criticize them. And then you go into debates and arguments. No, this Dhamma is right. That Dhamma is wrong. What you're saying is wrong. You're stupid. I'm right. And all of these other things happen. And what does that lead to? That leads to further aversion, that leads to clinging, that leads to mental proliferation, that leads to quarrels, sometimes even violence. This is the state of the world that we live in for the last how many ever eons. Suppose a man needing a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake. I wonder when you would need a snake. <laughs> but anyway, saw a large snake and grasps its, grasped its coils or its tails. It would turn back on him and bite his hand or his arm or one of his limbs. And because of that, he would come to death or deadly suffering. Why is that? Because of his wrong grasp of the snake, so too, here some misguided men learn the Dhamma, and because of the wrong grasp of those teachings, they suffer. Here, Bhikkhu, some clansmen learn the Dhamma, and having learned the Dhamma, they examine, they examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. When he says wisdom, what does that mean? 
Wisdom is the product of samadhi, panya. Sila, samadhi, panya, which means here is somebody who has actually walked the path. Here is somebody who has actually followed the precepts. Somebody who's actually done right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, who's applied right effort, understood right mindfulness, and had right collectedness, leading to samadhi, which then leads to insight and wisdom. Examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they gain a reflective acceptance of them. They do not learn the Dhamma for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates, and they experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Those teachings being rightly grasped by them conduce to their welfare and happiness for a long time. Why is that? Because of the right grasp of those teachings. Suppose a man needing a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake and caught it rightly with a cleft stick, and having done so, grasped it rightly by the neck. Then although the snake might wrap its coils round his hand, or his arm, or his limbs, still he would not come to death or deadly suffering because of that. Why is that? Because of his right grasp of the snake. So too, here some clansmen learn the Dhamma because of their right grasp of those teachings. Therefore, bhikkhus, when you understand the meaning of my statements, remember it accordingly. And when you do not understand the meaning of my statements, then ask, ask either me about it or those bhikkhus who are wise. Ask those who have walked the path. If you have some doubts, if you have some clarifications required, ask as many questions as you can, right? Obviously, it's still limited to three, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a pretty serious indictment of misinterpretation. Yes. Like, you're going to die. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well... Uh, looking at the wrong view of the teachings, you could say that he's talking about concentration and what he right. learned before and how dangerous it can be. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. It can lead to a lot of suffering. It can lead to psychosis in some cases. Yeah. It can lead to a lot of, you know, very painful processes. And then ultimately having wrong view, where does that take you? Suffering. It takes you to suffer. And the whole us. Yes, that whole mass of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Bhikkhus, I shall show you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Bhikkhus replied. The Blessed One said this, Bhikkhu, suppose a man in the course of a journey saw a great expanse of water, whose near shore was dangerous and fearful, and whose further shore was safe and free from fear. But there was no ferry boat or bridge for going to the far shore. Then he thought, there is this great expanse of water, whose near shore is dangerous and fearful, and whose further shore is safe and free from fear. But there is no ferry boat or bridge for going to the far shore. Suppose I collect grass, twigs, branches, and leaves, and bind them together into a raft, and supported by the raft, and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. And then the man collected grass, twigs, branches, and leaves, and bound them together into a raft, and supported by the raft, and making an effort with his hands and feet, he got safely across to the far shore. Then when he had got across and had arrived at the far shore, he might think thus, this raft has been very helpful to me since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to hoist it on my head or load it on my shoulder and then go wherever I want. Now, Bhikkhus, what do you think? By doing so, would that man be doing what should be done with that raft? 
No, venerable sir. By doing what would that man be doing what should be done with that man? Here, bhikkhus, when that man got across and had arrived by at the far shore, he might think thus, this raft has been very helpful to me. Since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to haul it onto the dry land or set it adrift in the water and then go wherever I wanted. Now, Bhikkhus, it is by doing so that the man would be doing what should be done with that raft. So I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Mm -hmm. Bhikkhus, when you know the Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even the teachings, how much more so things contrary to the teachings. How could the Buddha say that? You should abandon the teachings. Is he saying that or is he saying abandon your attachment, attachment to abandon the clinging to the Dhamma? You follow the Eightfold Path. You utilize the Eightfold Path. You use it as a raft to get to the far shore, to experience and realize here and now Nibbana, the end of suffering. But once you experience the end of suffering, you, use a, you have to use a path until you come to a point where all craving has gone, all conceit has gone, all wrong views have gone, all ignorance has gone. That, what does that mean? What, that means that the mind now is fully liberated. That fully liberated mind automatically, by default, follows the Eightfold Path without second thoughts, just automatically. That mind has right view, right intention, speaks with right speech, acts with right action, has right livelihood, is effortless in the right effort, is mindful all the time, and is collected whenever they want. Meaning can go into any jhana, into cessation, whatever it might be. But do they grasp onto that with pride? Do they say, I have achieved this? And therefore, this is the right way, and you should practice it too, mm -hmm. because this is the only way out. Sure, it might be all of those things. Sure, it is all of those things. But what use is it to use the Dhamma in that way? So you abandon the clinging to the Dhamma, abandon the pride of the Dhamma, abandon the attachment to the Dhamma. So it's not like you abandon the Eightfold Path. You're always using it until it becomes your nature. Because there are these things, there these six standpoints for views. What are the six? Here, because an untaught, ordinary dis, uh, person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, regards material form thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards feeling thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards perception thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards formations thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered, thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. And this standpoint for views, namely, that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too he regards thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. So here there is someone who considers these five aggregates or one of these five aggregates as this is mine, this I am, this is myself. In other words, they, in other words, they take them personally. They identify with the five aggregates. And then there is a view which says, 
that which is the self is the world. This is the Atman Brahman idea, the non-dual idea, the idea that there is here a soul and there is out there an existence and the soul and the universe and the soul and existence are one and the same. And the universe is infinite and so am I, ultimately being the self. Atman, the self, Brahman, the substratum of the universe which is all-pervading source of happiness, which is there for eternity. This is the view that they have. But in having that view, they think that after death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. And they take that view as mine, as I am, as myself. So whenever they do this, they equate one or more of the five aggregates as some kind of eternal soul, as some kind of eternal spirit, as some kind of eternal identity. And because of that, they have wrong view. Because the understanding is all five aggregates are impermanent. And that which is impermanent is liable to cause suffering. And therefore, it can't be considered as me, mine, or myself. Bhikkhus, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma, regards material form thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. He regards feeling thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. He regards perception thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. He regards formations thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. He regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, mentally pondered thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And this standpoint for views, namely that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be impermanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too he regards thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Since he regards them thus, he is not agitated about what is non-existent. So he doesn't even have that view that that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. So he doesn't regard any of the five aggregates as self and he doesn't regard even this view, nor does he identify with any view, ultimately. And because of that, since he regards them thus, he is not agitated about what is non-existent. In other words, that which is considered self, you can't really pinpoint, because that is all impermanent. Everything that is conditioned is impermanent and is liable to cause suffering, and therefore cannot be considered self. So how can you have agitation about that? Only when you identify it as self and think that the self is existent, is there something to be agitated about. But if it doesn't exist, if it's non-existent, why worry? Why have anxiety about that? When you truly see this, when you truly see that there is no permanent self and you understand it as it is right here and now through the five aggregates when you understand and let go of the clinging to the five aggregates then you won't have any restlessness at all arise because the five higher fetters that are still present that is the restlessness the conceit the craving for jhana, craving for formless realms, and the ignorance. These are the five higher feathers that prevent you from crossing all the way into arahatship. 
The restlessness, the craving for jhana, and the craving for formless attainments. These three are dependent upon conceit. And conceit arises whenever there is an identification with the five aggregates. When you let go of the conceit, everything else falls like a house of cards. When you let go of the identification, will restlessness arise? What is there to be restless about? When you let go of conceit, who is it that wants jhana? Who is it that wants the formless attainments? That idea completely goes away. So there's no more craving for that. There's no more craving for existence or non-existence. And of course, when, when uh, ignorance is gone, one knows completely the Four Noble Truths. So once you know that completely, then ignorance is gone. You see the links of dependent origination clearly. You understand them clearly. You understand the impersonal nature of all things. You see for yourself how the Four Noble Truths are there present in every moment. When this was said, a certain bhikkhu asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be, bhikkhu, the Blessed One said. Here, bhikkhu, someone thinks thus, Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Then he sorrows, grieves, and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. That is how there is agitation about what is non-existent externally. So what, what is he talking about when he says what is non-existent externally? Everything you see around you, everything you're experiencing around you is experienced through the six sense bases. So the idea is that the world itself that you experience subjectively is created by the six sense basis. You can't say that this is the color purple. Now I can say this is the color red and you might also say that this is the color red, right? But you're seeing it red because of the way your eyes perceive them. In other words, through the retina, through the different cones and so on in the eyes. You're only picking up certain frequencies. So you only hear a certain bandwidth of sound. So your experience of this world, how it's being received, it's all vibrations, right? Molecular vibrations, vibrations in the atmosphere, and so on and so forth. And all of that is being interpreted in the mind. And then the mind creates this image, this mind creates the experience for you. So what are you actually grasping at? What are you actually craving for? What are you actually having aversion towards? Everything is made up of form, right? This whole universe is made up of form. What is form? It's the earth element. It's made up of the earth element, the water element, the air element, the fire element. So, all of that is basically just molecules in different states of matter. But the interpretation of your mind causes you to say, I like the color red, or I like the color blue, but I hate the color red. I like chocolate cake, but I hate cheesecake. I like both chocolate cake and cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, these preferences that you have, they're created by what? They're created by you identifying with certain kinds of molecular vibrations. That's it. I like this taste because of the molecules that hit my tongue. These particular molecules I like. Those particular molecules I don't like. <laughs> so when you start to see it in this way, how can you take anything personal? How could you be agitated about it? Venerable Sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be, Bhikkhu. The Blessed One said, Here, Bhikkhu, someone does not think thus. Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. Then he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast, and become distraught. 
That is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent externally. Venerable Sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent internally? There can be, Bhikkhu. The Blessed One said, here, Bhikkhu, someone has the view that that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. He hears the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies, for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. Now listen carefully. So here is somebody who has this view of the self, that this is me, this is mine, this is myself, that I shall endure forever. This is the person that has this view. Then they are introduced to the Dhamma. And the Dhamma, which is for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies, the elimination of attachment to all views, categorically, all decisions, no identification with any of that. For the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. So this Dhamma is for the cessation of suffering, understanding what is suffering and letting it go through wisdom. That wisdom that arises shows you that everything is impersonal. But somebody with the view that I have a self or I am a self that will endure forever will think thus, so I shall be annihilated, so I shall perish, so I shall be no more. Then he sorrows, grieves, and laments. He weeps, beating his breast, and becomes distraught. This is how there is agitation about what is non-existent internally. So somebody who's introduced for the, to the Dhamma for the first time with the idea of some permanent soul, they have an immediate resistance when they hear, of, oh, this is not self, this is not you, this is not you. So they're like, that means then I'll be annihilated. And the reason why they think that this is annihilationism is because they still presuppose somewhere intrinsically that there is a self. Even on an intellectual level, they still think that there is a self. But once you understand that everything is impersonal, then there's no agitation about it. Then you've let go of that view of the self you've let go of the view of a personal self. Having let go of it, you experience peace. You don't have agitation about it. Because now you understand as it actually is, what is form, what is feeling, what is perception, what are formations, what is consciousness. You understand it all to be impersonal. You understand the sixth sense basis to be impersonal. You understand the experiences of the sixth sense basis to be personal, impersonal. You understand contact to be impersonal. So when you see all of this as impersonal, how could you get agitated? If you have truly let go of that view, you would not be agitated. And you wouldn't have this idea that I will be annihilated because you realize that there was no you to begin with. It's all a series of impersonal causes and conditions. Venerable Sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent internally? There can be, Bhikkhu, the Blessed One said. Here, Bhikkhu, someone does not have the view that which is the self is the world. I shall endure as long as eternity. So they don't have that view. They don't hold that. Then they hear the Tathagat, or a disciple of the Tathagat, teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences and underlying tendencies, for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. Therefore he does not think thus, so I shall be annihilated, so I shall per perish, so I shall be no more. 
Then he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast and becoming distraught. That is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent internally. Bhikkhus, perhaps you may well acquire that possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. But do you see any such possession, Bhikkhus? No, Venerable Sir. Good Bhikkhus, I too do not see any possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. Bhikkhus, perhaps you may well cling to that doctrine of self that would not arouse self, uh, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. But do you see any such doctrine of self, Bhikkhus? No, Venerable Sir. Good Bhikkhus, I too do not see any doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. Bhikkhus, perhaps you may well take as a support that view that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. But do you see any such support of views, Bhikkhus? No, Venerable Sir. Good Bhikkhus, I too do not see any support of views that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. That includes right view as well. That includes the Dhamma as well. So in the first case, the Buddha is asking, do you possess uh, something that would be permanent, eternal, everlasting, not subject to change, that might endure as long as eternity? The bhikkhus, having seen for themselves all that is not self, know that there is nothing that can be possessed, which can be considered to be permanent, which can be considered to be everlasting, which can endure as long as eternity. In the second case, the Buddha is asking, you might cling to a doctrine of self. Perhaps there might be a doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. But the bhikkhus say there is no such view possible because they have seen for themselves taking any kind of view and attaching to it, clinging to it. What does that mean? You're defending that view. I am a self. I exist as a self. This is me, this is mine, this is myself. Defending in that way, being attached to it, what happens? You have anger, you have frustration, you have irritation, you have this whole mass of suffering that arises. So in the same way, the, the Buddha asks, you might, have take a, you might well take a support, that view, or as a support, that view that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And the bhikkhus say, no, they don't. So he says, I too do not see any support of views that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as support. <coughs> bhikkhus, there being a self, would there be for me what belongs to a self? Bhikkhus, there being a self, would there for me, would there be for me what belongs to a self? Yes, Venerable Sir. Or there being what belongs to a self, would there be for me a self? Yes, Venerable Sir. Bhikkhus, since a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended as true and established, then this standpoint for views, namely that which is the self is the world, after death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. Would it not be an utterly and completely foolish teaching? What else could it be, Venerable Sir, but an utterly and completely foolish teaching? So here the Buddha is saying, okay, if there is a self, right, there is a self, let's say, would there be for me what belongs to a self? Yes. 
there would be something that belongs to a self. So if there is a self, there would be something that belongs to that self. That is whatever it might be that the self possesses. And then there being what belongs to a self, would there be for me a self? In other words, if there is something there that presupposes that a self possesses it, then it also presupposes that there is a self. So the idea is a lot of people might think that the form is self or the form is possessed of self or feeling is self or feeling is possessed of self. That perception is self or perception is possessed of self. That formations are self, formations are me or I possess formations. Consciousness is me or I possess consciousness. So there is some kind of self, intrinsic self that people may believe in and they take one or more of these five aggregates one way or the other. That they belong to me or that they are me or I am in them or I am separate from them. So the Buddha says, if you have such a doctrine, how do you let go of that? So he goes to this, he says, Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? What do you think? Impermanent. impermanent. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering. suffering. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself? No. no. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Impermanent. impermanent. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering. suffering. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself? No. no. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is perception permanent or impermanent? Impermanent. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering. suffering. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself? No. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Are formations permanent or impermanent? Permanent. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering. suffering. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is consciousness permanent or impermanent? Impermanent. impermanent. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No. no. Therefore, bhikkhus, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material form should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of feeling, whatever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, near, all feeling should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of perception, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all perception should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of formations, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. All formations should be seen as they actually are with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of consciousness whatsoever, 
whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all consciousness should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Seeing thus bhikkhus, a well-taught noble disciple, becomes disenchanted with material form, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with formations, disenchanted with consciousness. Does this sound familiar? What happens when you see the arising and passing away of consciousnesses? Mm -hmm. You see they are impermanent. They become tiresome, so you see them as dukkha. Therefore, you see them as impersonal. There's no control of them. Mm -hmm. What happens? You experience equanimity with nothingness. As you get deeper and deeper, that equanimity changes into disenchantment. You become disenchanted with all arising and passing away of formations, of consciousness, of feeling, of perception, of form. Being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Remember, dispassionate is that attitude, that, that Teflon mind, that nothing sticks. It just glides on through. It comes from the word vairagya, which means to be detached. No longer seeing this as me, mine, or myself. No longer seeing it as, you know, something I have to engage in. Completely disengaged from formations. Disengaged from consciousness. Things disengaged from feeling. Disengaged from perception. Disengaged from form. Through this passion, through that attitude, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. So that this passion leads to cessation, leads to the experience of Nibbana. Having seen that, one comes, one knows that the mind is liberated, and then one understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Bhikkhus, such a bhikkhu, one who understands this and sees it, is called one whose crossbar has been lifted, whose trench has been filled in, whose pillar has been uprooted, one who has no bolt, bolt, a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered, destroyed all of the fetters. And how is the bhikkhu one whose crossbar has been lifted? Here, the bhikkhu has abandoned ignorance, has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stone, done away with it, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. So in other words, that bhikkhu, that person, that one who has attained to arahatship has let go completely of ignorance, abandoned it, because they have completely understood right view. They have attained to the super mundane right view of the Four Noble Truths. This is how the bhikkhu who is one whose crossbar has been lifted. And how is the bhikkhu one whose trench has been filled in? Here the bhikkhu has abandoned the round of birds that brings renewed being, renewed being has cut it off at the root, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. In other words, that bhikkhu, that one who has attained to arachim, has abandoned the possibility of further rebirth because there is no more becoming, no more identification, no more concretizing of a sense of self at power, no more habitual emotional reactions, no more clinging. That is how the bhikkhu is one whose trench has been filled in. And how is the bhikkhu one whose pillar has been uprooted? Here the bhikkhu has abandoned craving, has cut it off at the root, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. So what has he abandoned? He has abandoned craving. Craving already he has abandoned for sensual experiences, <coughs> but he's also uh, abandoned the craving for existence and the craving for non-existence. 
This is how the bhikkhu is one who has no boat, or rather whose pillar has been uprooted. And how is the bhikkhu one who has no boat? Here the bhikkhu has abandoned the five lower fetters, has cut them off at the root, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. That is how the bhikkhu is one who has no boat. In other words, he has let go already of the first five fetters. He no longer has a belief in personal self. He no longer has doubt in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. He no longer has any clinging to rites and rituals with the idea that they will take him to Nibbana. He no longer has any sensual craving. He no longer has any aversion. And how is the bhikkhu a noble one who, whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered? Here, the bhikkhu has abandoned the conceit I am, has cut it off at the root so that it is no longer subject to future arising. Remember what I said? That conceit, that fetter of conceit, gives rise to restlessness, gives rise to anxiety, gives rise to agitation, gives rise to craving for existence in a form realm or a formless realm. When that conceit of I am is gone, that conceit of identifying with any of the five aggregates is gone, then there is no mental agitation. Restlessness goes away. There is no craving for further existence. That goes away. No craving for jhana. No craving for formless attainments. And already ignorance is gone. And so that is how the bhikkhu is a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. Bhikkhus, when the gods with Indra, Indra is also Saka, it's another name for Saka, with Brahma and with Pajapati, Pajapati here is actually Mara, seek a bhikkhu who is thus liberated in mind, they do not find anything of which they could say, the consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. Why is that? One thus gone, I say, is untraceable here and now. The mind of the arahat is empty of craving. It is a mind without craving, if you will. I had to. I had to. But without that craving, without that conceit, without that ignorance, without any of that, how could that mind be traced? That mind is completely void of these things. That mind is signless. <clears throat> signless in that it has no objects of craving. It has no objects of hatred. It has no objects of delusion. It is void. It is empty. It is signless. It has nothing there because there's nothing there to measure it by. It is immeasurable for that reason. There is no conceit there. There is no mana. There is no measuring. So how could you trace, how could you, it's like a free bird, that mind. There's no way you can grasp at that mind. To try to read into the mind of an arahat, all you can see is that it's just free, there's nothing there, it's just empty. So the devas, the brahmas, mara, they can't do anything. They can't scope out that brain or the mind of the arahat because there's nothing there to identify it with. So one thus gone, that's another word for the Tathagat. That's what Tathagat means, one thus, thus gone or one come forth. But one thus gone, meaning one who has attained full Nibbana, one who has attained full awakening, there is no way to trace that consciousness. It is known as non-reflective consciousness, anidasnam vinyana. That consciousness doesn't reflect onto anything. The mind of the arahat is completely free of the notion of I, me, or, me, or mine. Although they might use the words I, me, or mine, just as a way of transacting with the world. The mind of the arahat will still have feeling, will still have perceptions, will still have intention, will still have consciousness, will still experience contact, obviously, but it will not reflect anything. It's just 
arises. There is no you then. There is no you in between. There is no you here or there in between. It's just all processes happening, completely unestablished. So saying, so proclaiming, I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins thus. The recluse Gautama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. The reason why they say that he teaches annihilationism is because they <coughs> assume that there is a being. That goes back to that same question. Is an arahant a being or a non-being? If you say that he is a being, then you're saying that there is someone there, that there is something to define that being by. But if you say he is a non-being, then that means that he was a being at one time, he's no longer a being. But the Arahant was never not a being, nor a being. The Arahant completely understands that there was no self to begin with. Once they understand the completely impersonal nature of all things, conditioned and unconditioned, because Nibbana also is impersonal, there's nothing to grasp at. And there's nothing to grasp at in the mind of that Arahant. So how could you say that it is the extermination of an existing being once you realize this? As I am not, as I do not proclaim, so have I been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented thus by some recluses and Brahmins. The recluse Gautama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. Bhikkhus, both, both formerly and now, what I teach is suffering and the cessation of suffering. If others abuse, revile, scold, and harass the Tathagat for that, the Tathagat on that account feels no annoyance, bitterness, or dejection of the heart. And if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagat for that, the Tathagat on that account feels no delight, joy, or elation of the heart. If others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagat for that, the Tathagat on that account thinks thus, they perform such services as these for me in regard to this, which earlier was fully understood. They perform such services as these for me in regard to this, which earlier was fully understood. So in other words, when they do honor, when they do respect, when they revere, when they venerate, a Buddha or a Arahat. In the mind of such a being, being, quote unquote, the, there arises the thought that they're doing this because they fully understand it, or they have some appreciation for the Dhamma. They have some appreciation for noble ones. That's it. So they'll just say, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Mm -hmm. Well done. Therefore, bhikkhus, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass you, on that account, you should not enter entertain any annoyance, bitterness, or dejection of the heart. And if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate you on that account, you should not entertain any delight, joy, or elation of the heart. If others honor, respect, revere, and venerate you on that account, you should think thus, they perform such services as these for us in regard to this, which earlier was fully understood. Therefore, bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. Is form yours? Is feeling yours? Is perception yours? Is formation yours? Is consciousness yours? Once you actually see it as it actually is, just let it go. Let go of all identification with it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is it that is not yours? Material form is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Feeling is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. 
Perception is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Formations are not yours. Abandon them. When you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Bhikkhus, what do you think? If people carried off the grass, sticks, branches, and leaves in this Jetta grove, or burned them, or did what they liked with them, would you think... People are carrying us off or burning us or doing what they like with us? No, Venerable Sir. Why not? Because that is neither our self nor what belongs to ourself. So too, Bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. That is how you should see the five aggregates. Just impersonal processes. Somebody pokes you, abandon that, right? It's just an experience. It's just a feeling, impersonal feeling. Somebody says something about your form, abandon it. It's just an impersonal feeling. When you have a perception, what do you do? Do you grasp at it and say, I want it, or this is going to make me feel good? Or just abandon it and just have happiness right there and then. Treat the five aggregates, see the five aggregates as what the Buddha just said, as just grass, as sticks, as branches and leaves. Anything happens impersonally, I mean, anything that happens pleasant or unpleasant should be seen as impersonal. Anything that happens that is neutral should be seen as impersonal. The experience you have in jhana, abandon it, <laughs> right? Abandon it meaning don't take it personally. The good feelings that you experience with loving kindness, the good feelings you experience with compassion, the joy, the equanimity. Don't abandon that, abandon the attachment to it. So those feelings are seen as what? <clears throat> Impersonal. Don't say, this is my loving kindness. This is just loving kindness. It arises and arises, it goes away, it goes away. This is the joy that arises in jhana. Is it my joy or is it just joy that arose? Abandon it. Abandon the first jhana, abandon the second jhana, abandon the third jhana, abandon the fourth jhana, abandon infinite space, abandon infinite consciousness, abandon nothingness, abandon neither perception, non-perception. And what happens? Cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Everything that arises in the mind is not yours, is not you. Abandon it. Let it go. And then you will experience cessation. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork, there is no future around for manifestations in the case of those who are arahats with taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely liberated through final knowledge. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who have abandoned the five lower fetters are all due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final nirvana without ever returning from that world. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who have abandoned three fetters and attenuated lust, hatred, and delusion are all once returners returning once to this world to make an end of suffering. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers, no longer subject to perdition, bound for liberation, 
and headed for enlightenment. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, free of patchwork, there arise who are Dhamma followers or faith followers. These are Sotapanas with path. Are all headed for enlightenment. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, free of patchwork. In the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork, those who have sufficient faith in me, sufficient love for me, are all headed for heaven. In other words, those who have let go of just even doubt, who just practice the Dhamma out of confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, already are attaining towards right view, attaining towards having the right precepts, attaining towards keeping the precepts, having generosity, and so on. And that leads them to a higher state in a Devaloka. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Wow, you guys are really delighted. This Your instructions were free of patchwork. <laughs> <laughs> Very detailed. Yeah, you had a. Uh, can you explain uh, at the lengths three through like five from consciousness to the six four base? Yeah. So consciousness there is basically the sixfold consciousness. That is the eye consciousness, the ear consciousness, the nose consciousness, <clears throat> the tongue consciousness, the body consciousness, and mind consciousness. That's one understanding. So consciousness also gives rise to nama rupa or mentality materiality. That means that mentality materiality depends upon consciousness for it to be experienced. And consciousness cannot be experienced without mentality materiality. So for consciousness to continue, it needs mentality materiality. And for mentality materiality to be experienced, it requires consciousness. Mentality is made up of five things. It's made up of contact, feeling, perception, intention, and attention. So that means it gives rise for the potential for contact. It gives rise for the potential of feeling gives rise for the potential of perception, gives rise to intention, chaitana, which is the inclination of the mind towards something, wholesome or unwholesome. And attention, that is, the attention moves from one thing to the other, and so, so does consciousness. Attention is what drives forward the consciousness, intention is what drives forward the formations. Then there is form, materiality, which is made up of the four great uh, elements, that is earth, water, fire, and air. In other words, the different states of matter make up this form, this body that we see here. It's made up of the different elements. In order for mentality to be able to be function, it requires the materiality. That is to say, it requires the brain, which is all of this stuff that's there. Through that, you experience the factors of mentality. That is the contact, the feeling, the perception, the intention, and the attention. So in order for you to know that there is a materiality, you need a mentality. But in order for mentality to actually work, it needs to have materiality. So there is that interdependency there as well. Housed within this mentality materiality are the six sense bases. So that is the eye, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. I see. So... So materiality is dependent on consciousness and vice versa. Right. So that there's like a cycle there, right? Yes. So is there like a, which one came first or how does that work? <laughs> That's a chicken and egg chicken, right? <laughs> I see. 
Because the thing is, consciousness continues to rise and pass away in every moment. So it continues to give vitality to the materiality. So you could say the start, one starting point in one life is just at the birth of that new Nama Rupa. So there's consciousness that descends in that mentality, materiality, and then that starts the process. But it's not the same consciousness that departs that body. It's a consciousness that continues to change, continues to arise and pass away. I see that makes sense. And so I guess uh, kind of a follow up question to that is so infinite, in infinite consciousness. Could you like describe what the like the signpost there is, or like what yeah. do you see there? So generally, in infinite consciousness, what you see is the arising and passing away of I consciousness, or your consciousness, or nose consciousness, or tongue consciousness, or body consciousness, or mind consciousness. So the way you would see I consciousness could be in multiple different ways. In other words, you could you can notice flickering behind your eyelids. You could notice like concentric circles suddenly, you know, coming into being. You can notice little things, dots, things like that, coming and going, coming and going. Uh, with the year consciousness, you can notice flickering happening, like clicking, you know, snapping going on. Or actually you might even notice when you, like some people can experience infinite consciousness while their eyes are open and while they're walking. So the world around them is like slowed down and they see the frames of reality. Like when you slow down a film reel, you start to see the individual frames. So it's like you're under strobe lights, you know, and you just see like movements like that, jerky movements. And then sometimes people can hear the sound and then they hear every other sound. Like there's a blank there because they're seeing the arising and passing away of sound the arising and passing of your consciousness. Some people experience nose consciousness through phantom smells in their meditation, or they'll experience phantom tastes in the tongue, or they'll experience electricity in the tongue. And likewise, in the body, they'll experience tingling or vibrations all throughout the body, or they'll experience some kind of heat and cold in the body. And then with the mind, they start to see their thoughts, the stream of thoughts, and they start to see the gaps in between the thoughts. So these are some ways that they can be experienced. So I guess my question there is, so you know, so like the eye consciousness flickering, for example. Uh, so you know that at, uh, contact and feeling, right? You see right. like those moving. So I guess, how do you know that that's the consciousness link that's arising and passing away and not feeling arising and passing away? Well, you're feeling it. You're experiencing it. Yeah. That's the thing. When there is consciousness, there is also feeling and perception tied to it. I see. So you can't, like, is it, you can't know, like, for sure and pinpoint, oh, like, this is the consciousness link, like, arising and passing away. Well, when, where there is the consciousness link, that is to say the arising and passing away of eye consciousness, there is eye feeling there as well, and eye perception there as well. So because you see that feeling is rising and passing away and because you're dependent on consciousness, like through that inference, you can say that consciousness must be rising and passing away? Yes. But feeling is dependent upon contact. And in contact, yeah. there is the eye consciousness. Um, so I guess if, if you say that, so if, we, if we're saying that consciousness is the bare like cognition, right? So I guess, okay, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> he was not joking when he was saying that his world was clear. <laughs> okay, well, <but> that <clears throat> uh, a lot of people say that uh, in um, all of these. Uh, Practically, uh, Gautama had uh, 2,600 years anticipation on uh, system dynamics and emergence of a phenomena, etc., that science has discovered just 50 years ago. Now, 
by the point of view of uh, uh, system uh, uh, dynamics, uh, if we say that uh, uh, suffering is dependent on all of those 12 things, mm -hmm. you just need to take one out that suffering doesn't exist anymore. You have to take out craving. In, that's the one that's easy to take out. Yeah. But in theory, you take out one of these ones and uh, suffer it because suffering is born by the interaction interaction of these twelve elements. First, let's define what is suffering. What is suffering? What is Dukkha? That whole mass of suffering, what is it? It's a bummer. It's, it's a, a bummer. bummer. <laughs> it's a bummer. Yeah. But there's no bummer in feeling. There's no bummer in contact. But I understand what you're saying. You're saying if you cease contact, then there won't be any potential for feeling. Yes. And so on. That's true. Okay. But that means that when you have cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, there's no suffering going on there. In fact. Yes. But by no, because if we take it uh, uh, like a simulation computer that makes interact these things and makes a lot of suffering, in that case, uh, the only thing that you would notice is that every time that there is a, an I, there is a, I, me, myself, mm -hmm. there is also suffering. So it would be just a signal right. that when you have this. And in fact, every time that we seem to happy moments, we are not at the center of the happy moments. Exactly. So when we, when there is an experience going on, there is a superimposition of I, me, or mine to it. And that's where the trouble begins. But if you see everything as it's just a happy moment, it's just a pleasant feeling, that there is no potential for suffering to arise. Yeah. So it, it's not abandoned. I mean, it is that if you see that there is the I, me, and mine, uh, you are uh, inclined mm -hmm. towards suffering because it yes. is one of the necessary conditions for the emergence of suffering. Yes. You take out the necessary condition and it cannot arise anymore. Yes. It's like, um, it's like those two comic strips. I don't know if you guys have seen this. They, they, they show memes on this, and there's memes on this on social media as well. The first one is, this guy goes to the doctor and he says, uh, it hurts. And he says, uh, uh, you know, where does it hurt? When I exist. <laughs> And the second one is, there's a guy who says, I want happiness. And there's a monk who comes by and there's a bubble, right? It says, I want happiness. So he says, take away the I, that's the ignorance and the conceit. Mm -hmm. Take away the want, that's the craving. And what do you have left? Happiness. Mm -hmm. Easy. Easy. <laughs> no self, no problem. No self, no problem. <laughs> I think that's a book too, isn't it? Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie Smith. Right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. The the statement that Eduardo said, you know, in theory, that anywhere along the twelve links that suffering could, but and and you said later you talked about potential. So I think would it be accurate to say, in theory, anywhere along the way, mm -hmm. it's interrupted the potential for suffering. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So if you see you're identifying with feeling, then you can let go of that, and there's no more suffering. If you see that you're identifying with your nama rupa, your mentality and materiality, which is the five aggregates, mm -hmm. but you let go of that, then there's no potential for suffering to arise. Yeah. Okay. So all of questions to that. So I guess. Uh, so the Buddha said in the Sutta you just read, right? Don't take feeling as me, mine, or myself. 
and he also follows up with Tate Consciousness and says, Me, my name is self. So, um, someone might hold the view like, okay, like this, this consciousness, which is a very cognition, right? This is who I am because I'm cognizing all of this, so this is me. Mm-hmm. And so, like in infinite consciousness, you see the, uh, you see, like, let's say flickering. So, you come to the view, oh, okay, this feeling is not me, my inner myself, because I see it going in and out. But how do you see the, <clears throat> the cognition, like, of knowing? Like, wouldn't you have to see the knowing of going in and out for that to be the arising and passing the layer of consciousness? So that knowing itself arises dependent upon the arising of that consciousness. Yeah. So in other words, that knowing is a feeling as well. That cognition of what you're experiencing Mm -hmm. is tied to the experience itself. Yeah. Which means that when that experience goes away, the cognition of that goes away too. I see. So then what about like awareness? Same thing. I see. Mm -hmm. Everything is dependent upon something or another. Is there, is there like awareness or is, is there like, is there even, is there such a thing as awareness? Because isn't it, it's like each thing you see is just like, like a dot, like say, let's say. And so there's no like central, like, like for someone to say there's the central awareness, that's just a feeling. Mm -hmm. And so that feeling, and that feeling arises and passes, so there's no like awareness. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I like the term field of awareness, especially within infinite consciousness. My experience anyway is this phenomena is is popping on, you know, more you see more and more the gaps between. Yeah. And and so, you know, and then you realize that the mind is putting this together like a seamless movie and it is not seamless at all. Right. And the mind is filling these gaps. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's so yes. it's so totally impersonal. Yes. So There's like all any of the stories that we hang on to, like what? It's just, it's just, most of it's fiction. Yes, <laughs> yes. The filling in the gaps—that's a good way of yeah. putting it, because that's what the mind does. Yeah. The mind, like your six sense bases, they take in some information, and then they just fill in the rest mm-hmm. through interpretation. And so. It is not a seamless movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to, I mean, on that point though, just to be kind of like picky about the phenomenology, but. You know, if we were to say that you are noticing consciousness yeah. arising and passing away, or, you know, let's even yeah. just say it's in the impersonal noticing, right. consciousness is noticing itself arising and passing away. How could consciousness know that it wasn't present a moment ago? And how could it know that it just arose from nothing? Like, there can't be a knowing in the gap, right? We there is not a knowing in the gap. Right, there isn't. But then, how does how does it know there was a gap? You only know the gap. So when we talk about those gaps, all right. So we need to we need to clarify first when you talk about gap because there's multiple gaps here. <laughs> <laughs> there's the gaps in consciousness, which is the nothingness, which means you're perceiving nothingness. There's the gaps you experience in neither perception or non-perception, where there's non-perception. And then there's the ultimate gap, which is the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. So which gap are you referring to? Well, we could take the, the first gap first, but then we could also take the cessation gap, because what I'm saying is, if there is something perceiving a gap, then what is, what is present in that gap to perceive? Consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> right. But then, then we're saying that there's some kind of substratum consciousness that's existing while there's this arising and passing away there. Because what I'm saying is if there was truly a gap in consciousness, you know, let's say, um, or let's take cessation, for example, right? You come out of it and you can kind of tell that time has passed, but there was no, there was no awareness of anything in that case. So there, the way you could tell that time had passed is like the clock, for example. Mm-hmm. But in infinite consciousness, you know, to say that you've perceived something passing away, to say that there was an awareness that something had just ended, 
if it was truly like a gap in awareness, then it wouldn't there you wouldn't even be aware of the gaps. Mm-hmm. Like it would seem continuous the way that like everyday experience does yeah. because And you go in cessation. When you are not aware of the gap. Right, yeah, because you are going in cessation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it is an interpretation. But those gaps that you're referring to, which happens at infinite consciousness, where you're seeing the flickering. It's your interpretation yeah. of what you're doing. So the experience is subjective, completely subjective. Yeah. So the, the experience and the conclusion there also is completely subjective, dependent upon how you're seeing it. But the gap between those arising and passing away is nothingness. That's what we're saying. So what we're actually seeing when we see infinite consciousness is really infinite contact. There's contact, 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 contact. Mm -hmm. That's what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. But maybe ultimately the moment between each contact uh, process. Yeah. I mean, what? There's nothing there. But how can you so that's, that? that's what I'm saying. Is yeah, it? isn't that memory? Isn't that perception that says, yeah, I saw that, I saw that. Yeah, that's perception seeing that, it's perceiving that there was something there that was like... But not in infinite consciousness. And just normally the mind is going, right. and there's just moments, but there is something yeah. between the moment. Right. Yeah, I mean, just being nitpicky, like, I, you know, I get it, it's, an ex- it's a subjective experience, yeah. but... To say that there, that like, it proves that there wasn't some kind of awareness there. I feel like, in cessation proves that there what that there isn't like a continuation of consciousness. But infinite consciousness itself is just like an experience that yeah. seems like there's yeah. some kind of instability. Yes. Yeah. When there's cessation, you really understand there is nothing. Right. Between then you truly understand that uh, consciousness is dependently arisen. And it's impermanent, absolute, that there's no continuation. Yeah. No soul. There. That's why it says that it's the perception of impermanence which leads to the perception of Dukkha, which leads to the perception of Anatta. In other words, when they say perception, what they're saying is it's an interpretation of that experience which leads to an interpretation. So the mind is having these insights, subjective insights based on the subjective experience at infinite consciousness. Right. But somehow everyone who goes there seems to have that experience. Right. So it's more about just the the insight that's gained by this feeling of instability. Yeah. So... And some people also experience infinite consciousness as just that all-pervading consciousness. So it's like the space is filled up with that all-pervading consciousness, but you have to go even deeper and understand that that consciousness is dependently arisen on the idea of there being space. So first there is the experience of infinite space, and then there is an experience that consciousness fills up that space. But even that is also subjective. (laughs) Yeah, I wonder if someone who has wrong view would even be able to see the, would see it as all pervasive instead of the momentariness of it. You're saying if somebody had the wrong view, would be able to see only the pervasiveness of it. Yeah, like they came in expecting <clears throat> this all pervasive consciousness, and so that wrong view would prevent them from seeing the momentariness, which would prevent that insight from arising. Well, that means they didn't see it, though. Well, I, I'm basing this off of a teacher who said that he went to from the yoga path to the, to the Buddhist path, and he was at first in the higher jhanas seeing everything as. A continuum, and then his teacher said, "No, see it like, see the momentariness of within that." Oh, so he was, he was guided to see it in that way. Yeah. So then he was guided towards right view. Mm. Mm. <coughs> yeah. Of course, that was probably concentration. <laughs> <laughs> so it really doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. 
<laughs> LSD can give you a lot of these same experiences, yeah. and you don't come out of it enlightened, believe me. <laughs> the flickering the, and the, the frames. Oh, that's you know, yeah. anybody who's done that has experienced all that stuff. Yeah, there was one time I was walking into the kitchen uh, at someone's house and I started seeing infinite consciousness or my subjective experience, let's say, of infinite consciousness, where it was like frames and it was like there was strobe light and everybody was moving just. Some there was like a some kind of blank there, like yeah. there was no fluid movement there. Yeah. You know, and somebody else experienced like they were hearing the sound, but they were just hearing the, the sound, and there was a gap, but they could it was like continue. It was a continuous sound, but they were hearing also like the the lack of sound there, mm -hmm. the gaps. Mm -hmm. So they knew there was some kind of gap there. It's I found it interesting to hear like um like a motor, which, you, you know, just normally you would think like, that's just a continuous sound, but Looks then like, you realize it's just made up of yeah. all these little sounds and there's gaps and, yeah. and, and changes and, yeah. uh, it's the same with music as well. Right? Music, when you play the piano, when you play the violin, you play the guitar, there's, there's gaps in there too. Hmm. So I'm curious, I don't know if this is a me thing, or if you experience this too, after after having these experiences and and realizing truth more and more and more, like I, a lot of times I'll turn on music and it just like the different parts of it sound off. Yeah. Like the, the tracks are off. The yeah. Parts are off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't break my brain. It's just not you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you become a lot less interested in music. Yeah. Because it creates emotional, you know, turmoil in your mind. And, you know, whereas you just go, oh, yeah, I'll ride it. Mm -hmm. Now you're just more, you know, just let it, let it be. Yeah. <coughs> Are you sure it's the music of the. The current generation yet listening yeah, to yeah. or? Well, <laughs> <laughs> <Dumb stuff. laughs> yeah, like, once you've six or at the tenth song that just popped in your head, then you're starting to get a distant chance. Yeah, song. exactly. A lot of people will experience that too, like we're, like this this earworm, right? Just mm -hmm. continuously that song. There was a musician friend of mine who said that in order to uh, do away with that earworm is to actually listen to the song itself and then finally you just so in other words what you're doing is you have the craving for that song mm -hmm. and you satisfy that craving and now you find relief that's their way of dealing with them as a musician i try to find it in your head yeah <laughs> you can't find it <laughs> but isn't that kind of the uh, what was his name rita isn't that his view yes exactly right which uh, is not the case. Yeah. It's more. Yeah. Well, what, what, what was doing in the lyrics and so What they said was when you have a earworm, or whatever that song is that keeps popping up in your mind, listen to that song, song actually, meaning put on the tape, put on whatever, and listen to the song, and it goes away. Aversion uh, therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. They're doing it because they have the craving for it. And as yeah. a musician, they're like listening to it and then only they find relief. But what if you find relief by just letting go completely and not having to deal with it at all? Well, six R. Six R. Mm -hmm. Try telling, that, said, try yeah. telling that to the musician. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Yes. Wait, so I think you had uh, mentioned how after cessation, you know for sure that there was a gap, or did you, or did you mean to say that you knew that there was a gap? Something happened where there was like, oh, I, there was like, I was there and then I wasn't there. I see, but that that's also like, like you can't be sure of that. Like that's also just like a feeling, right? So like, well, you'll be sure of it. But like the way you know it is like through like, a, through you only know it after you come out of it. Yeah, I, I guess it's like also like a nitpicky point, but like, 
like let's say like okay, okay, yeah, never mind. No, I, I think you're making a valid point, which is like the only way you could know for certain is like the clock is you know some time has passed. Because it is ultimately a memory, right? But then in that case you'd have to actually go into cessation <laughs> and come out and say how much time is passing between the two. Yeah, I'm just like objectively that's the only way you could know for sure for right. sure. Objectively, the only way if if there is somebody outside reviewing what's mm -hmm. happening, because you will not realize when you stop and when you recover. So everybody needs uh, headbands now. In order uh, to in, out you, you you need uh, an observe an external observer and many monitoring on your body. Yeah. Otherwise, it's impossible. It's been done. <laughs> yeah, we need more of that, right, David? We need to get more of those next retreat. <laughs> it's kind of like when you um, go under anesthesia and come out, you're like, whoa, what happened? Right. Yeah. That's it was a gap, yeah. But the difference is you never remember where you go in. It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you don't count down. You don't, there's no going in. There's only coming out because everything stopped. And the, the perception of going in somewhere is not there because... But you perceive coming out because you are, you exist coming out. Yeah. Plus, I mean, when you do come out, I mean, that, that, that intense experience that you have after that completely is like, yeah, exactly. where did that come from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. How did that happen? This is not the same. Yeah, this is not the same at <laughs> all. <laughs> yeah. So, we were talking about all those complicated things, but in the end, what do you want? This change of personality yes. right so change of perception perspective yeah. yeah so how about you because you're young and you have fully <laughs> so what in mundane you know or you know language what changes you in your life or the perspective mm -hmm. the view that's the main thing that changed now that's all very subjective that's the other thing. And, you know, there's all this um, idea of let's put a sorapana, let's put somebody, let's put this person or that person under an MRI and under all of that. And, okay, fine, do it. But how can you objectively say that this is what it is? That <clears throat> these are the markers of a sorapana, or these are the markers of a sakadagama? because it's the subjective experience. Even if you could take that and say, okay, we've done the MRI scans and we've said, this is what it means to have a mind without craving. This is what it means to have a mind without conceit. This is what it means and so on and so forth. Fine. And you can replicate it. Maybe you have neurofeedback machines. Maybe you have these things that can like zap your brain into that or you take a jhana pill as somebody once talked about or whatever it might be. Fine, you have that experience. But where is the wisdom? So what has changed is the wisdom, the view, the insight, the knowing. State of ignorance. The very beginning. Yeah. Having let go of that, then everything else changes. Yeah, because people get too caught up on, oh, the mind's going to come to a stop. All we, all we need to do is get it to stop, you know? <laughs> but when it comes to a stop, it understands things. Yeah. And that's the change, yeah. not the stop. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we could just stop your brain by zapping it. Yeah. It would give you multiple cessations. And... <laughs> <laughs> then what happened to your life? Lobotomy. 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 You no longer see things in the same way, which means 
your experience of everything is just, you see everything exactly as your sixth sense basis experience it. But you also see things as they are, which is there's no longer that veil, that filter system of I have to have this, I have to have that, I need to do this, I need to do that. And I mean, this might sound super mundane, but mundane, it, I think it's mundane, is you notice that if you have no more of, I have to do this, I have to do that, whatever is required for in that moment is provided for. So there's complete relaxation. Oh, you know. Nothing to do. Nowhere to be, nowhere to go. They tell you to do this, you go do this, you come back, that's it. They tell you to sit here, give a talk, give a talk, that's it. You leave, you know, that's it. Relaxation. Huh? Relaxation. Relaxation. Mm -hmm. Relief. 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 So there's no sense of, I have to achieve this. There's no sense of, in the next 20 years, I want to be known as this kind of Dhamma teacher or, you know, all of this nonsense. Just, well, I, I think maybe you're, you're looking for the first path here. Right. right. Which becoming isn't given up at that point. Yeah. Right. In that first path, you let go of any belief in a personal self, which means you no longer can see like there's some kind of a soul there. You just understand that, yeah, this is all impersonal. And there's no question about whether this path is right or not. It's just that, yeah, this is the path. And sure, maybe before you like to light some candles or light some incense or whatever, you're not doing it out of some ritual because it's going to take you to Nibbana. You just do it because you enjoy it. But there's no longer any clinging to rites and rituals for that. You replace something that you took personally previously, and then you look at you laugh at it and you go, why did I take that personally? Yeah. 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 Your memories change completely. So with that first uh, path, when you do have craving and you do have aversion, you start to notice it and you laugh at yourself. You're like, why did I take that personally? Mm -hmm. And you let that go. Sometimes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but more often than you did before. There's a certain backing away from everything. Yeah. Right? Just kind of, it's still there, but it's, you know. You want to apologize to everyone that <laughs> <laughs> you may <made> suffer. <laughs> Go around. Sorry. Um, but you're still engaged in the world, so where are you deriving your motivation from? What's what's pulling your hair back? What's making you want to write a book and do as well as you do here uh, in what you do? Uh, are you talking about in first path? What happens? Yeah. So in first path, you're still motivated by things. You're still motivated by the desire to do this or the desire to do that. And so if somebody had let go of complete desire to become, let's say, if somebody had let go of any desire to be, then they're motivated by two things, actually. Wisdom and compassion. Mm -hmm. Which means that they see things as they are. And so whatever is required for that situation, they do so in a compassionate way. They don't have any kind of... So in that sense, whenever they're doing things that are required for that moment in the best way possible, then it all works out. There's no craving there. There's no grasping there. There's no need to do something or... There's no need to prove yourself there. There's no need to seek the approval of others. Mm -hmm. just, just the doing. There's just the doing. No personal gain. No looking for an outcome from that doing. And actually, when you do that, then everything seems excellent. You're not trying to be excellent. You're just doing what is required. And to other people, that seems to be excellent. Effortless. Effortless. Yes. Yes. Your definition of wisdom? 
Your, the definition of wisdom, it, well, really wisdom is understanding and seeing the links of dependent origination, but the application of that wisdom, which is to see everything as it actually is, always understanding that this is not me, not mine, not myself, always seeing it as an impersonal process. And the, the compassionate aspect of that is understanding that not everybody sees it in this way. Mm -hmm. All right, huh? let's share some minutes. <laughs> may suffering once be suffering free, may the fear struck fearless be, may the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabit in space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they all protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, 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 Sadhu,